thing this is. <laughs> so the first thing is it doesn't um, place in the public domain a device which um, carries out this fraud. The website uh, where Omar gives away the source code and schematics for this device very clearly says that he did not include the code for carrying out this attack. Um, also, I don't think this breaches um, responsible disclosure. This is, we gave the bank three months notice in private and it's now been over a year since they were notified and so far only one UK bank has fixed it. The rest of the banks are still as vulnerable as they were when we first told them. So it didn't get um, very much traction within the university and Ross Anderson wrote a letter back. Um, it's well worth reading the full one, it's quite fun, but here's one of the sections. Second, you seem to think that we might censor a student's thesis which is lawful and already in the public domain simply because a powerful interest finds it inconvenient. This shows a deep misconception of what universities are and how we work. Cambridge is the University of Erasmus, of Newton and of Darwin. Censoring writings that offend the powerful is offensive to our, our deepest values. happens when you have some censorship? You have media coverage. So <laughs> we managed to get on Reddit, Slashdot, Independent, um, Heise, um, Mail Online, and when I looked this morning, oops, um, there were 103 news articles about this story. And if we want to see the effect this has on suppressing information, here's the downloads of it. I think it's fair to say that it's been highly counterproductive to try to remove this material from the web. Okay. So I think this all comes back to the original claim at the beginning of my talk. Um, I think one of the major reasons that the UK bank industry has been trying to remove this material is not because it is um, going to help criminals. The criminals already know how to build these sorts of devices. It's not hard. But what it does do is harm the bank credibility when they try to refuse customers being refunded. And we've already heard people who have been able to use the material that we presented in order to get their money back. But there's still a lot more to, a lot more to do. Um, one open question is, a lot of fraud is happening in ATMs, and this type of attack doesn't work against ATMs. Because the way ATMs work is when you put in your card and type in your PIN, your PIN is then encrypted and sent back to your bank, and they then check it. So we can't interfere with that. But still we get people coming to us very regularly who say that their card hasn't been stolen, yet money has been withdrawn from an ATM, and then they haven't got their money back. We know how some of these are explained. Um, there was one um, from a customer of Santander Bank, um, it was Abby at the time, um, Emma Wolf, and she had money taken from her account um, from an ATM. The bank said that um, it must have been her or her fiance um, who had access to the card, and they wouldn't give her money back. But then, um, after quite a long battle, the police arrested one of the bank employees and it turned out that bank employee was able to issue a second card under that person's name and then make the fraudulent withdrawals. So maybe that's happening and maybe the banks are denying it, but we're not really sure. Um, and then there, there's a lot more in the EMV specification. There's 4,000 pages of it. I'm sure there are some other bugs in there. Um, one thing that we haven't looked at which is quite closely linked to um, Ralph's talk on attacking baseband, is how well do terminals work when faced with some corrupted data. The 
it has all the same bad properties. The EMV protocol has all the same bad properties as GSM. Um, a lot of the data is in ESN1 format, which is very hard to write a decoder for. Um, I've got a, an implementation of it, and then the first few versions of it, it would regularly um, uh, say that it's expecting 10 billion bytes. And the reason is that there are two ways of encoding lengths in the EMV protocol. The first one is a single byte, and where the, the most significant bit is zero, and that will get you up to 127 bytes. But for anything longer, you need to have um, the most significant bit set, and now the rest of that byte is not the length of the data, but the length of the length. And then you have more bytes that come along later on where say how big that length really is. But that means that it's very easy to trigger a terminal code to do a mem copy or some operation in a vast number of bytes. And that might be one way of trying to attack the terminals or, or ATMs. It's harder to attack the cards because the cards do very little processing. But even those still do have bugs. Um, for example, it's been uh, well known in Germany that um, at the beginning of last year, um, some sort of bug in the card, I don't know the detail, um, stopped it working. Um, there's some suspicion it's to do with um, a year being incorrectly interpreted as hexadecimal. So I think there's a lot more scope for doing these sorts of investigation, and that's where the device that Omar built could be very useful. Um, it's, the software is, is freely available. Um, it's quite easy to manufacture the hardware, and it's something for you to experiment with. Okay, so I think I'll take some questions now and let the people who are standing sit down. Anybody wants, uh, has questions, so please line up left and right to the microphones. And does the internet have any questions? Okay. Yes. The first question is, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the presentation, you said that the fraud went down in 2009, and that, that this, possibility, this possibly had to do with the added security measures. But in 2009, Albert Gonzalez uh, and France got busted, which were big players in the card in get scene, and around 130 million stolen card numbers. Is this possible that the change in fraud is just because these guys left in the card in game? Um, yeah, it's certainly a possibility. Um, the numbers he, were, he was dealing with are, were quite large. But in terms of the overall levels of fraud, um, I'm not sure if that's enough to explain that very large drop. But yes, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, yeah, I've, you've been uh, talking about the um, V protocol uh, all the time. But at least in Germany, there are those wireless uh, pin pads or terminals. Yes. Uh, have you ever looked at that? So in, in, in Germany... I think they're using GSM, I don't know. But. So in Germany, the cards are EMV. There, there's several different um, applications on these smart cards, but some of them are EMV. Um, we haven't looked at the protocol that's used for communicating, communicating between the terminal and the, the rest of the network. Um, that's sometimes GSM. It's sometimes Bluetooth. Um, well, we don't really know what's being sent on there. The, the right approach would be to do encryption. Um, we don't know whether they're doing that. <laughs> well. And also, it matters what's being sent over it. So the PIN should certainly never be sent over that communication line. The PIN should go only to the card. Um, but it's possible the card number is being sent unencrypted over that line, and that can still leak some sensitive information. 
Um, there are nowadays uh, some NFC-based uh, payment methods, uh, such as uh, PayWave and PayPass from uh, Visa and MasterCard. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about the security of these and whether they may be susceptible to the same sorts of attacks that you described? So we haven't looked into that yet, but it's something that we're definitely going to do. Um, it's a little bit more difficult because for all its flaws with, um, for all EMV's flaws, one advantage it does have is the publication the specification is publicly available, certainly most of it. Um, you can go to emvco.com and download it. That's not the case with contactless systems. Okay. The spec is not public. So we're going to have to first of all reverse engineer it, um, understand how it works, and then see which of these attacks is going to apply. Um, we just don't know for now. Um, we know it's very similar to EMV, um, but it's got some, some differences. Okay, thank you. Another question from the IRC. Mm -hmm. What are you saying is that when the pin is never needed to unlock the secret key inside the chip used to create a Mac? Yes, in EMV that is never the case. Uh, the pin can be used in two different ways. One is the pin can go to the card. The card will check it, send a yes or no answer, and it will also update its state internally. Um, and that state will then be used as part of the input of the Mac. But a card will never refuse to produce a Mac. It will always produce a Mac. It just constrains what's going to be put into it. The other way the pin is used is where it doesn't go to the card, it goes to the bank. And then the bank can check it, and it can also send the message back to the card, which will update its, its internal state. So it's not like many smart cards where you have to type a pin in to unlock it. All the pin does is um, sets a flag inside. So um, I'm wondering where in the uh, process is stored which bank uh, the reader talks to, or does this just talk to the MasterCard? Because I'm wondering whether you could build a chip uh, that invents a new bank, and you can impersonate that bank and draw money from nowhere. So there's, there's a few systems going on. So one is that of the bank identification number. The first six digits of your account number identifies your bank, and then either the terminal or the system the terminal connects to has a, a list of which bank controls which bin, and that controls how they're going to route the transaction. The other way is that um, the I mentioned at the beginning of the transaction, you have this transaction authorization stage. I'll go into that. Um, sorry. The card authentication stage, where the certificate is sent, includes a RSA digital signature, and that is signed by the card scheme. So that's MasterCard or Visa or Amex, and that is issued um, by these card schemes to a bank for a certain range of bins. So if you invent uh, another bank, um, one thing that you might need to do is to get one of these certificates, and, and that's probably going to be a bit tricky. Um, I don't know what sort of authentication the, um, these card schemes use. Um, we've found plenty of problems with commercial certification authorities not doing adequate checking. Um, but I don't know what will happen if you give a terminal an invalid certificate or, or a certificate doesn't exist or just no certificate. It might still accept the transaction. I think it's something that would be worth trying. Hi. Uh, another. Hello. Um, you, you mentioned that one bank fixed this issue, so, so I was wondering how to fix it actually. So there, in addition to the TVR, there's another flag that is sent called the issuer application data. And this is proprietary between the person who made the card and the bank which issued the card. Effectively, it's the same organization. And this includes a number of bits, and one of them is the bit that you'd want to have, which is, was the PIN entered correctly or not? So the issuing bank can know whether the PIN was entered correctly or not, but the terminal can't because the terminal isn't able to parse that field because um, it doesn't have a defined format. And I think that's how the banks are fixing it. They're using that flag. But although they know whether the pin is entered, incorre entered correctly or not, they don't know whether it should have been. 
and a bank cannot do something like reject all transactions where the PIN is not entered, because there are plenty of cases where the PIN will not be entered. Um, there is a, yet another flag, um, the terminal status indicator, which says whether the terminal should be able to produce uh, a PIN, but a lot of terminals set this incorrectly. So 